Hello everyone, I am S.C. Coleman, author, and welcome to my channel. In this video, which I'm going to be doing a little different than usual, I'll be sharing an idea that I came up with, or at least that I discovered in some way. The idea of the intelligent fountains, or the intelligent fountains, excuse me. Now this idea is essentially the antithesis, or the opposite, a sort of answer to the question that is what we know as censorship. The control of information naturally should have an opposition, which would be the dissemination of information. Now, just disseminating information in general in a raw form would create a extensive database which is for most people not applicable to their lives. And so that's when you get in the idea of analysis and dissemination of actionable and pertinent information. Actionable usually means pertinent but you could have actionable information which isn't pertinent to the person who's uh, who it's being given to. And in that context, the person would be... Uh, the, the actionable information would not be pertinent to that person's particular situation. So this idea is all about a mechanism, a concept, which would facilitate not just the dissemination of information, but analysis of information that's necessary and pertinent to who it's being shared with. Now, uh, pardon me here for the uh, flipping through pages <laughs> as I am looking for my notes on this particular idea. I also did a video about this concept and the constitution associated with intelligent fountains as my idea. Now, this is the primary vehicle that I use conceptually for distributing letters around uh, for public interest, essentially, uh, public service notices. Of course, the idea of serving the public is similar to our understanding of, in most cases, serving papers that you would on a counterparty in a lawsuit. So most of the time when someone serves the public with a notice, they're actually treating the public like a opposition. That's not the idea here. The idea here is that the information that you're delivering is not to inform opposition, but it's actually to inform in a idea of intelligence. So most corporations, militaries, state entities, pretty much everyone else but public individuals or private individuals, or, or just individuals in general. Most people do not have access to an intelligence service. That's the idea here, to provide that service to everyone, or mostly everyone anyway, to the regular person who cannot afford the high price tag on regular intelligence services, such as the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, MI6, uh, those are state-run intelligence services, but then you, of course, have private contractors. Most people know about intelligence service private contractors as far as security goes, but not necessarily the idea of an intelligence service contractor, which gets hired by state entities, usually by NSA, uh, CIA agents, things like that. They, they usually contract out to firms, and those firms are your actual intelligence service mechanism. They gather information, they run research, they analyze data, and then they deliver the product to their consumer, their customer. So if you're going to do this on a large scale for essentially everyone else, the thing's going to look a little bit different. And so that's the idea behind the Intelligent Fountain. So the purpose would be to provide actionable intelligence to all for open purposes and free of any charge. The core values would be honor, creativity, and adaptability. Now, the core values of every institution are important to what its purpose are. You would want somebody, of course, honorable to be operating in this type of position because if you act dishonorably and you don't understand what honor actually is, then you could damage not just the organization, but 
many. There's a whole bunch of other uh, adverse variables to action, di dishonorable activity. Most people don't understand exactly what honorable is, I would say, anyway. And I see it as not necessarily honesty, but honorable conduct means, means measuring the, the, re, the possible repercussions of an action and also responsibility for use. So if you have information that could damage somebody, using that information responsibly means not simply uh, leveraging the information for personal gain. So if you have important information, like uh, somebody who's been taken hostage, you go to the hostage takers and say, I have this information, so pay me money and I won't say anything. That's dishonorable because of all the other implications there. Obviously, that's a, a very, um, very simple explanation or a very simple and, and a metaphor. But there's one for you anyway. Obviously, creativity is important because when you're talking about an institution like this, it should be able to function. The members should be able to find creative ways to disseminate information. And likely today, our environment is incredibly uh, inimical. It's adversarial towards the spread of information, especially useful information. Mostly, you have a lot of control mechanisms that desire the spread of useless and uh inconsequential information because they naturally don't want actionable information getting out to people who can understand and comprehend what's going on and then something to do about it. Usually that pertains, of course, to the people controlling the information. They understand that that's a specific danger for them. So if you're talking about an environment like that, then yes, you would want people who are disseminating actionable information, which could lead to the downfall of those people controlling the information spreading mechanisms you would want them to be creative enough to find different avenues and different approaches and not simply adhere to the same established functions of information dissemination or uh, reporting or basically telling other people about something. So creativity is gonna be a big one and then naturally adaptability goes along with that, the ability to adapt to different environments that are constantly changing. So the constitution for this organization idea this idea is not a structured hierarchical organization in which you have one head that directs everybody else, but rather an organization of different p individuals who are they themselves in their own capacity capable. And they don't take directive from anyone, and this, this organization shares information and train cross-trains between the members and each support each other. But there's no actual head of the organization, nobody who's giving orders. Every individual in this organization is responsible to each other and to their mission, and each one can carry that out of how they so choose in their own capacity. And so that's the whole idea behind the Constitution, which provides a framework or structure for the admittance of members to ensure the organization is populated by skilled and creative individuals, artists. Strangely enough, you would probably want people who are artistic to run a intelligence service because the artistically minded individual is not only creative about how they do things, but they can get someone's attention. That's a big thing. I'm generally monotone in most of my videos because I'm taking a non-emotional approach, which means I have to keep everything uh, at level like you're giving in a professional report. But if you're trying to gain somebody's attention, then yes, you would need an artist to do that most of the time. Obviously a good one, because there's a lot of bad artists out there who can gain no one's attention and who just make the same copycat crap that they're trained in the school system, essentially. So training for this group will be done in three main ways. There will be self-taught, joint, or cooperative training, which will be either with individuals partnering with each other, self, self-driven, you know, you just choose to partner with someone else, or it could be a established member taught kind of idea, a classroom setting. However, testing for skills uh, in the organization to be certified in the organization will require another member to administer it, but the testing certifier might be chosen by the test taker and only a demonstration of capabilities required. 
So let's say you're trying to certify yourself as having a particular skill. Well, for the purposes of organization, you want to actually have that skill, not simply be a check mark on paper, right? So you could go to another member and say, I want you to test me on whether or not I'm actually capable in this field, and then they write off on it, sign their name, all that stuff. What that does is that it shows, it means it gives you a mechanism to not only show that you actually know what you're doing, but it also means that the other member can verify that you do, and that's very important towards the structural capability of this organization, because no member, considering you benefit by the abilities of other members and you might rely on them for something, you don't want another member to simply be passed through uh, when they don't actually retain the capabilities that they're ascribing. This is something that you find happen a lot, especially in hierarchical organizations. My experience in the Marine Corps, a large number, in fact, most of the people that were ever promoted to rank didn't have the capabilities to occupy the position that they were being selected for. It was simply a promotion seen as a benefit rather than a responsibility. And that's something you find most of the time today is that people seek after promotion like it's some sort of uh, climbing up a ladder, right? They don't see that position as being responsible of having more responsibility to others. They see it as a benefit for themselves. And that's exactly what you wouldn't want. So that's the reason why everyone in this in this organization, they're all equal across the board, essentially. They're all um, pr practical, uh, capable agents of this organization. It's sort of like the idea of having rangers that will go out into the field somewhere, the old idea, not the current one of just calling somebody a ranger who's not actually a ranger. A ranger would go out and they would basically be dependent on their own survivable survive, survivability in the environment they're going into. They don't have this massive support structure behind them. Obviously, army rangers today have a huge support structure behind them. But if you have a person who is trying to do something on their own and they don't have, they've lost connection or something, they still have to operate and do their function. And so this whole idea is that the members look out for each other, but each of them can actually act on their own, their own initiative, their own volition, without the necessity, right? That's the big thing, without the necessity for a major support structure behind them. Because if you require a large support structure behind you, then you f effectively can't function without it. So once joining, a member will choose a pseudonym as their member name. This is a false name, but it's the same idea as an author who chooses a pseudonym, not, not only for the purpose of hiding from possible enemies, individuals who wouldn't want them sharing what they're sharing. This has been a long established concept that authors operate behind pseudonyms, but it's also to have something a little bit catchier. If you've got a name that's hard to pronounce, spell, what other, you choose a name that's much easier to uh, appeal for appeal, uh, purposes of appealing to an audience, right? Like S.C. Coleman is a lot more appealing than my full really long name. So when you choose a pseudonym, uh, another member will compile a new member file entry to be dispersed and stored by the member base. Every, every member has a database they store and a compiled roster of members. Certain achievements will be Awarded as demonstration of applicable learned skills and members will come up with diversified sources of funding to be operational resources, which will be divided up among the members and handled responsibly. Obviously, if a member gets funding for their operations and then they squander it and use it in a way that's not applicable to the operations, well, that damages everyone, including themselves, because then they can't op they don't have operational capability anymore if, they, in fact, they require resources for that. Often, you have to be creative and figure out how to do things with no resources whatsoever. You simply have to go out and acquire them for yourself, whatever you might need. So gray is the foundational color representing stone, which includes skill in research, storage, and information disbursement. Copper is communication and conduct, which involves studying components of language and communication. It requires the teaching of a learned skill and the fulfilling of a task for the group. Silver requires the presentation of an idea, study in public speaking and marketing, and the promotion of representation of the organization. 
Gold involves learning and authentication methods, demonstrated verifications, studies and pattern recognition, and analysis of collected information to provide something actionable. Diamond will include studies in defensibility, planning, coordination, support mechanisms, and identification of vulnerabilities. Finally, Onyx, or Black, will study teaching requires demonstration of teaching technique by giving five classes or presentations studies and organization and making programs and recruitment methods also must bring in the new members successfully to achieve the onyx designation each designation in the file under marks of proficiency with a corresponding addition to clothing and correspondence so basically once you achieve these marks you get them put in your file but you also have to include them on your body somewhere so that you can demonstrate this to other members uh, in your physical person if you talk to somebody else face to face and then you also include it in all correspondence when like a letterhead members can reach out to one another freely share responsibility in the group and authenticate one another through a minimum of three methods and no member should take offense from another member's authentication requests in fact it's the opposite you should approve of somebody going the extra mile to authenticate because it means that that protects you better as well. And you can in turn do the same because it's all about the benefit of the members in the group rather than uh, simply some sort of hierarchical head there that's been appointed by someone else and then you really never know who you're actually taking orders from. Now, a example of a member sheet here would start with the member name. So for me, it would be SC Coleman Author. And then this is just an example. If I was going to be invited into this group or if I was going to try to join it, then I would have to present some sort of created artwork that would then be authenticated. And this would be a book. The title of the work would be The Glass Empires. Copies of cover drawings would serve as one mechanism of authentication. And as the members determine, they can choose more than one or whoever member is, however many members are involved in the verification of this individual to accept into the Intelligent Fountains or their particular chapter of the Intelligent Fountains because this could pretty much go any way anybody wants. I'm simply providing the idea and, you know, it, it could be set up by anyone. It could have changes. It doesn't matter. This is just a concept here. So uh, the next would be essays, on, an essay on contents. Uh, detailing what's in the book and things like that all of the stuff where they can match this the idea here is that you would have like insurance companies have a signature that then they match to future signatures and stuff unfortunately people's signatures change all over time so that's not really a good uh, uh, authenticator as as in my experience my signature has degraded over time and I recently had a denial for an insurance form because my signature did not match with my original, which meant I had to jump through a whole bunch of other hoops for authentication purposes. So that's the idea that we're trying to avoid here, is that we're trying to get good authentication. Naturally, somebody who has created an artwork, it's highly unlikely that if they're the or actual creators of it, that they will not easily pass multiple, authentic, pass multiple authentication methods, even if they drop one thing here or there, right? You don't your memory does not serve for exact memory, but if you're familiar with something, that should be obvious. And if you're not familiar with it, then you're, you're not familiar with the creation that apparently you took uh, months or even years to build, or, well, I suppose it depends on the level of, of complexity to the, the artwork. As for me, a book takes a significant amount of time and investment, and even though I might forget details here and there, I'm still going to be familiar with my own art, my own uh, writings, because it's a lot of investment. I'm, you get a familiar, familiarity with something by doing it over time. Next, I'll have a screenshot of the publication, you know, have dates, information, things like that. And if somebody's trying to authenticate me, all of these are measures that they can essentially do like security questions. There's all sorts of ways that this can be applicable. Um, and that type of authentication in that context does not require an, the actual name of the person or any of these other biomarkers or any of these other paper markers. It simply requires the artwork of whatever it is for that person to then show that they are that behind the author name that individual 
Right now we have very few of those authentication mechanisms today, which means as I've seen personally, it makes it very easy for someone to steal your author identity and steal the appearance of ownership over your works. Now, um, and this of course, I want to emphasize this is about public intelligence, publicly uh, intelligence for everyone else. And it's not actually about creating a body of people who are capable in artwork. Now, all those people who are create capable in different forms of artwork, say woodworking, say drawing, whatever it is, all of them can, in fact, together in their group, raise resources for their operations, as I have detailed in the Constitution, in order to make money for themselves and also their, further their own capabilities, as this concept goes. So miscellaneous skills that I have li listed are writing, drawing, painting, martial arts, shooting, physical security, exercise languages, uh, analysis, cryptography, research, legal documentation forms, travel, public speaking, radio communications, planning and strategy, and of course there's a lot more skills uh, and knowledge that I have uh, that relates to practical and actionable abilities that I can do. Uh, mostly I don't have some of the usual certifications that you need for finding a job. That's not what this idea is. This idea is not you go out there and get these other certifications. In fact, when you're listing a skill here, you should not list, you can, but you should not list certifications of outside sources because in this context, that doesn't mean anything. The actual tangible capability of what you're claiming to be able to do, that's what means something. And that's these, these colors that I talked about before, those are about the basic capabilities that a member in this organization should have. So if you don't have all of those colors, that's fine. If you have some of those colors, then that means that you have been certified by another member. That means that other members can depend on you likely being capable enough to a an extent that you'll be able to function in any sort of scenario where that skill is required. Uh, and then uh, skills breakdown, extrapolation, uh, detailing exactly what's behind your skills and talents, you know, specifications if, if you're good at uh, with, you know, the, the usual typical one is asking if somebody's good with Office Suite software. Uh, not, not everybody's very good with Excel, right? Not everyone's good with Word, whatnot. So, it, you know, that putting detail into what exactly you can do with your skills, that's important. So I have writing, but not too long, of course. For writing, I have experience in writing books, fiction, nonfiction, also letters with an understanding of advanced formulation and technique for informative and entertaining purposes. Uh, drawing, I have capability in freehand drawing with experience in book cover design, various techniques in shading, coloring, mostly with a unique style. Painting, layer painting with acrylics, having made portraits and scenes. Martial arts, I've got Jeet Kune Do, Craft Pani Mel Pani, boxing, kickboxing, green belt, and McMap, sword, spear, dual sword, bow and arrow, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, wrestling, grappling, and training, and I have a lot more experience in, in these different areas as well, but that's just to give you a general overall idea of what talents I bring to the table, what I can teach other members, and what I can use in any sort of field, situation, or scenario. And then for shooting, I've got rifle, pistol, shotgun, close quarter drills, point shooting, armory work, changed out pistol triggers on Sky CPX2, completed courses at the Sonoran Desert Institute, etc. So that is just a sample. Of course, there would be a lot more ex extrapolation if I was doing this for real and trying to detail all the different skills that I can I possess and I can use to assist other members in whatever need that is or that I use in my own personal work. But the idea here is that you'll have members who are physically capable and members who aren't physically capable and you can lean on each other for different purposes. Because even if you're at requesting somebody for a personal matters, say somebody who's disabled is asking somebody in the group for help moving furniture. Well, that frees up time for that individual to do other things and basically be operational. The idea, of course, in the group is that if somebody in the group abuses anything, any capabilities, whatever, it might damage other members of the group, such as if they're constantly getting, trying to get somebody to do something for them, and that's taken away from a purpose that that other member might have. So there's a, naturally a balance there, and the idea here is that all the members working together in this capacity means that they'll be watching out for that. They'll be looking for the balance. 
Now, this is the actual idea behind the Marine Corps, the U.S. Marine Corps small leadership model. That idea that a overall mission is given out and then each individual component can go out and take care of business, as it were, with their understanding and their abilities means they can adapt to whatever changes in the situation might happen versus those who are paralyzed by having to constantly ask permission. Now, in my experience, initiative in, in any context, actually, in, in the Marine Corps has been punished. But it is, in fact, a positive character trait, leadership trait in J.J. Jittai Buckle, which means, of course, that those individuals who are penalizing initiative in the Marine Corps are uh, essentially, in some cases, saboteurs of the Marine Corps, and uh, their disgrace, in some cases, probably traitors. But that's the idea here, is that each individual is not an employee, right? It's not a, a slave of someone else. They are capable individuals who are providing a much, nowadays possibly, uh, well, it's always been needed, but nowadays especially, a needed source of information of, to the best of their ability, information that's applicable and useful for the individuals, not just some nonsense of something that you can't confirm happening on the other side of the globe. Obviously, in this context, you can confirm among your member base whether or not something's legitimate, but that's not the purpose for it. The purpose for it is not so that you can have some eyes over here on a different side of the planet. The purpose of this is that these individuals will do all of the functions of a intelligence operative and then give that information out to those people in the area that would need it. Whatever way that is, I've found uh, there's no real good way to do it right now. You have face-to-face. -face. That's not very effective nowadays because you're constantly be coming into people's filters. And usually when you have a, a conversation face-to-face -face with someone, they're not really focused on what you're saying. They're focused on you. So where the information is coming from. And if you tell them some particularly difficult to comprehend information, then they start testing you. If you write that, on the other hand, then there's a degree of separation. They have to deal with the content in front of them, not the individual making that content. And of course, as we all know, video platforms and online information sharing is highly controlled. That was designed like that because the information controllers do not want certain, they don't want certain types of information getting out, especially the actionable ones that actually teach people about what real really is the reality of their scenario, what their situation that they're living in. So I hope this has been helpful and this is a good concept and uh, adopted or otherwise, obviously you need multiple people to set something like this up. And the question of setting it up is just in general, however anyone wants to do it. Now I'll leave, uh, I'll leave like links and uh, other information here. Uh, but if you have any questions about this concept or you would like assistance with something, you can always leave comments, even though I expect I won't get any of them. So um, if, if nothing else, try to find a, a way to reach out. But I wouldn't trust very much any of these. I wouldn't trust at all, all actually, any of the online methods of communication. So thanks, and uh, stay safe.